What's going on YouTube? Aaron here. And in today's video, we are going to be jumping back into the maps, uh, kind of a continuation from yesterday's live stream. If you haven't seen that stream and you'd like to, it will be linked down below. But I wanted to make this isolated video to kind of go over the alleged route of uh, Brian Christopher Koberger on not only the evening and then into the morning on November 13th, but the following day on November 13th. Uh, and I think obviously a lot of people are talking about this, but it's worth mentioning in its own video here some of the things that I think really are um, telling about the probable cause affidavit and the network cell data that they were able to capture um, and obtain to include in the probable cause affidavit. For those of you who uh, are aware, obviously the uh, initial appearance was held on January 5th. Um, they had set the preliminary status for one week later at 10 a.m., but they have just now ordered that the status be held on the, on the same day, on the 12th, but now at 8 a.m. PST. So 11 a.m. Thursday is the preliminary status hearing. So the sooner the better, I guess. Um, but let's go ahead and hop into this here. I want to go back through each of these bullet points from the probable cause affidavit that uh, and well, yeah, the bullet points from the cell phone data and they, they reference obviously um, traffic cam footage and, and things like that. But uh, 2.42 a.m., let's just jump into it. Koberger's cell phone was located at his residence at 1640 Northeast Valley Road in Pullman. Um, so I've pulled up the entire map here. And obviously we have this image from the probable cause affidavit, which is pretty similar to my image if you cycle between them. Uh, mine is going to be a little bit off because I don't have the exact coordinates and we're going off of cell phone pings. Even the defense and the prosecution right now aren't going to have the most accurate, I think, uh, versions of his location. Obviously, the prosecution is likely going to be trying to obtain cell phone data from applications besides uh, just the cell phone uh, the network data that they were able to obtain. I think there's a lot of stuff that they might be able to go in and get from apps, for instance, that Brian may have been connected to, sharing location data that he was not aware of to better pinpoint certain locations. Um, if you guys remember the Chandler Halderson case, that's an example of that. Snapchat was running at that time on his phone and they were able to pinpoint almost exact locations of where he dumped body parts of his parents. It's horrific to talk about, um, but this is just kind of a rough map of that alleged uh, route that he went. So 2.42 a.m. he was seen uh, or, you know, the they pinged him near his apartments um, and then at 2.47 the cell phone shows it's traveling south through Pullman, but then stops reporting a network connection. So, of course, I have it just kind of going south through Pullman. Um, at 3.29 to 4.20 a.m., the Hyundai Elantra makes three initial passes by the 1122 King Road residence, leaving via Walenta Drive. It returns a fourth time at 4.04 a.m., first driving eastbound on King Road, it leaves the area at 4.20 a.m., traveling at a high rate of speed. So uh, after, obviously, his phone was reported going south in Pullman, he made his way over to the Moscow, the town of Moscow, specifically the King Road area. Mine doesn't have him going on Walenta Drive here. Um, but he's at the residence where the homicides took place, specifically... Um, Returning a fourth time at 4.04 a.m., which we know um, Zana had received right after 4 a.m. A Postmates delivery, um, food delivery service was delivered to the house just after 4. And then, of course, his, his car is seen on traffic footage speeding out of the area at 4.20 a.m. They think, they think the murders happened somewhere between that 4.05 to 4.20 range. Um, so then 4.48 a.m., only eight minutes later, the cell phone comes back online and pings at Blaine near U.S. Highway 95. So if we zoom out, um, not even 10 minutes later, um, his phone is pinged down here near Blaine, the town of Blaine. Obviously, my map is showing it kind of jet in, um, but this is probably the kind of the area. Once again, we don't know the exact pinpointed location where he was at. He could have been on one of these side roads, my particular map obviously is using Highway 95, 
Um, obviously, he probably used Highway 95 to exit. But then again, we don't really know because we just have the initial kind of cell phone data that is probably casting a wide net in terms of like where it's pinging from. Uh, but I'm sure they're able to get a more detailed version of that super quickly. Uh, and obviously the prosecution will use that to their advantage. Um, at 450, sorry, 448, the cell phone comes back on. So that's near Blaine. We just, we just went through that at 450. So a couple minutes later, between 4.50 and 4, 5.27 a.m., the cell phone pings near Genesee, then Uniontown, and finally at Pullman between 5.25 a.m. and 5.27 a.m., the sedan is recorded by five cameras in Pullman on the WSU campus. So uh, between 4.50 and 5.27 a.m. So uh, the Genesee location would be down here, so obviously it went further south. And then I believe he probably went around and then back up uh, and was seen on cameras near the WSU campus at 5.27 a.m., um, which correspond with the cell phone data as well. Um, so then at 9 to 9.21 a.m., this is the interesting part of this entire thing. This is the next morning after the homicides took place. The cell phone shows that it leaves Koberger's Pullman residence and travels to Moscow between 9.12 and 9.21 a.m. And it connects with cellular resources that provide coverage to the area where the King Road residence is located. So in the morning, this is the next day, we know Brian's phone was seen, you know, it was pinged leaving his residence. And then a short while later, it was pinging off of towers that serve the 1122 King Road residence area. So how close was he to the residence? We don't really know at this particular time. What was he going back there for? Was he going back there to see if there was a police presence there at that point? Was he, you know, obviously in a lot of true crime cases, it's not uncommon in, in, in uh, a lot of different cases, even not homicide cases. People that light buildings on fire will often stand behind the people putting out the fires. Um, so was this a case of that? Was he trying to go back and see um, if this had progressed, if people had found the bodies? Or was he going back there because we know that he dropped the knife sheath uh, and left it behind? Did he realize that night, oh my gosh, I don't have the knife sheath. What am I going to do? Um, personally, I don't know. I, I would like to think that he probably didn't realize in the heat of all of that, that he dropped the knife sheath. I don't think he probably was going to try to make entry back into the house. I think he was probably going to check in and just see, Hey, um, what's going on at the house? Are there people there yet? What's going on? One of the creepiest things about this for me when I read over the affidavit was that he is accused of coming back to the house. That's what the cell phone records indicate around 915 in the morning uh, after the murders. Is it possible? I mean, do you think he may have been going back to actually to go back inside? Do you think he realized that he left the knife sheath there? You know, it could be, but I don't think so. I think this is sometimes classic criminal behavior where they revisit the scene of the crime. I think he might have gone back there to see if there were ambulances or police cars. He probably expected the police to be there already. Um, and I, I think he went back to look and look for police or what kind of activity was taking part at the house. Sometimes the thrill, we've seen people stand behind police lines at fires. Arsonists do this a lot. And, and so I think that he was driving by to see the, the, you know, basically the fruits of his actions. If there were, you know, there should have been by that time, a lot of police activity and ambulance activity. So I think that that. So, yeah, obviously this expert is saying, um, it, you know, they can't confirm one way or another, but it's, it's very common. Like I was just saying, uh, for people to return to the scene of a crime, um, you know, we know obviously also that at that point when he would have gone back by, even if he would have been, um, a few blocks away, kind of peeking in to see if there was a big police presence. The 911 call didn't happen until just before noon the next morning. So when his phone was pinging near the residence off of towers that serve that area at 921 a.m., uh, he there wouldn't have been a police presence at the house at that point. So was he going back to look on the ground near his car? 
where he, maybe he dropped the knife sheath outside. I think there's a possibility he was at least seeing if it was outside on the ground once he realized there was no vehicles there, no police presence there. But I really think he probably was just keeping a distance and keeping an eye on the location. Uh, at 9.32 a.m., the cell phone returns to the area of Koberger's Pullman residence. So once again, uh, after he wakes up in the morning, goes over to the area in Moscow where the crimes took place. He then goes back to near where his residence in Pullman is. And then at 1236, almost three hours later, the cell phone shows it's near Kate's cup of coffee in, which is a coffee stand in Clarkston, which is like 45, 50 minutes South of Pullman. He has seen, uh, sorry, he is pinged on towers near Kate's Cup of Joe in Clarkston, Washington. Once again, this Clarkston town is bordering the Idaho. Uh, it's like a town called Lewiston and Clarkston um, that kind of border each other. They're split by, I think this is the Snake River. Yeah, the Snake River. Um, and that's interesting. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But there's a three-hour gap there. And then at 1246... The cell phone pings near Albertsons, which is a grocery store in Clarkston. And then the video footage actually from Albertsons shows uh, Brian exiting the Elantra at 1249 p.m. And then they also have the interior cameras at the grocery store showing him walking through the store, purchasing items, and eventually checking out. Uh, he leaves the store at 104 p.m. So many many hours later four over four hours later at 5 36 p.m this is the most interesting part of the probable cause affidavit uh, where they share cell phone network data but brian's phone reports stop it stops reporting to a network between 5 36 p.m the day after the homicides and 8 30 p.m okay we know also from the probable cause affidavit that he turned his phone off during the actual time in which the murders happened, there was like an hour or so period where he turned his phone off. So he clearly turned his phone off the, the, the night of the murders during the time in which they think the murders happened. He obviously had his phone on, in, on him leading up to the drive over there, which is very foolish. Um, but then he clearly turned his phone off in an effort to not show his location. I'm sure that that was his reason. So... Why does he turn his phone off? Why does his phone stop reporting to a network for three hours the next day? I believe that he was likely, just like the day before, or, or the early morning of the 13th, he was trying to not be tracked. He was trying to not report to the network because he was trying to be smart in that moment. I think he was down here in the Lewiston and Clark area, and then there's a three hour period where he's not reporting to a network. And I think that he likely ditched the knife. If he didn't ditch the knife the night before, there's a good chance. There's a lot of water along this area. There's a, there's a huge chance. I think he could have ditched the knife on his way back up to Pullman. And there's also a gap in time between the 1246 and 104 PM, the sighting of him leaving the Albertsons grocery store that they don't include. And I'm sure if they're including that his phone stops reporting to the network at 536, they probably also have network data between 104 and 536 that is valuable information. Was he on his way home taking potentially a long route? Because as we look at the map here, there is a route that goes along the Snake River on the way back to Pullman right here. So for example, if he left Clarkston to come back up, you could go along the Snake River even further than what my map is showing here and then eventually come over here and then back up to the, the city or the town of Pullman. So do they have actual cell phone data in this area? Was he along this road? It would be very easy to be riding along this road and to pull off. I mean, this is a spot clearly right here. My gosh, it's gorgeous. Look at this. Uh, and you could easily toss a knife straight into the water. I have no idea if that's what he did. I just know that that gap in time, that 536 to 830 with his phone being off is is definitely interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious about that. The other thing I wanna talk about is this right here. 
There's the reports that went, then once he got to Pennsylvania, he had the gloves on, he was moving the trash from his parents' house uh, to the neighbor's house. So that all certainly came into play. I want to ask you about the knife because I have heard, according to sources, that one possible... So we're not going to get into what he's talking about with the knife there, but we know now that it was actually the neighbor's trash can. After Brian returned back to Pennsylvania, it was... He had been putting his parents' trash in his neighbor's trash can. Now, he was likely being monitored when this was happening, but the biggest thing that I'm thinking of is for the prosecution to be able to prove that Brian was putting his parents' trash in his neighbor's trash can to avoid potential trash being picked up, which ended up happening anyways because they picked it up out of his neighbor's trash can. That right there is enough to show that he's guilty. If the, the, That's not normal behavior to, one, be wearing surgical gloves, but two, to be transferring your trash to your neighbor's trash. There's no reason why that should ever be happening unless you're trying to conceal and hide evidence on your own trash. So if for some reason there's a door camera, uh, if he wasn't being heavily monitored, which I think he probably was at that point, but if he wasn't being monitored, I'm wondering, were they able to see through a ring doorbell camera or something that he was transferring his trash uh, from his parents' house to their neighbor? And if that's the case, that's going to be crucial for the prosecution to be able to show that he was actively going out of his way to move the trash to the neighbors. I think that that points directly at him as being completely guilty in this. I think that there's going to be many more things that the prosecution has to you know, to get a guilty verdict on this. I think that they have a lot, a mountain of evidence, potential, uh, potential evidence that they have not released in the probable cause affidavit. There's a lot that, that probably hasn't come out just because they want to sit on it. Um, but I imagine, uh, we will know more very soon. This is just kind of what I wanted to get back into today. Let me know what you guys think. Did he go back to the house, uh, to potentially try to look for the knife sheath? Maybe he thought it dropped, uh, out uh, on his way out? Was he just going back to see uh, the potential circus that he thought he may have started and created at that point? And also, um, let me know, do you think he ditched the knife? Do you think they found that? I mean, I don't think that they found the knife. They haven't said that, but they did search his house. Um, there could be certain things that they maybe aren't releasing yet. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below, and uh, I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.